and welcome to another Sunday with me, John. So, what's on my mind this week? Well, I'm going to start off with a gig review. So, this week I went to see another one of those bands on my bucket list that I've never seen before, being the Average White Band. Um, or AWB, quite often you see them abbreviated to. And for those who don't know, you probably know two of their songs quite well, but you never knew they were by the average white band. One was um, a song that goes... You know that one? It's in Iron Man 2. It's when the... Uh, oh, what the other chap, the... Uh, Hammer Tech, Justin Hammer, when he comes onto the stage, he comes onto the stage to that. Anyway. Um, so you know that one. And the other one you know, which is my fa one of my favourites, which is Let's Go Down to the Pub. Or as the average white band, white band sing it, Let's Go Round Again. Yeah. Let's go down the pub. See? Uh, anyway, they were playing at the Albert Hall. And it's would you believe 47 years since the band was founded 1972 this band was founded uh, and yes it's gone through a few lineup changes but predominantly the, the bass player and the lead guitarist are the same two members that were there in 1972 when it formed and the other members of a few have died um, and uh, have come and gone over the years but the lineup at the moment is a really good lineup um, and, let's say, 47 years, and 45 years ago, they released their biggest album, which was known as the White Album. Um, so, go and look it up on Spotify, it's a great album. And it does actually have the... That's on that one. Um, so, they played it from cover to cover. That was the first half of the set. Cover to cover... Fantastic, and in the second half, they just got down. Um, the average white band are a funk band, there's no if, but, if, buts, or maybes. They're a funk band, and when they get funky, believe me, they get funky. Fantastic night out, and in, to the point where I think somebody on the side of the stage was saying, Guys, you need to wrap it up now, it's 11 o'clock, and these people have to go, otherwise, they're not going to catch their trains. So you know, that gives you an idea. They went on at uh, about half eight, so 11 o'clock, with a sort of 15 minute interval, they finished. It was a thoroughly enjoyable evening, thoroughly enjoyable evening. And, uh, you know, they finished with the favourite, let's go down the pub, or let's go around again. <laughs> Which was released in 1980. I didn't realise it was 1980. It was right at the end of that sort of disco era when, when disco went synth. So, uh, but I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. But it was a late night. I didn't get home till about 1 o'clock in the morning. Of course, I had to get up for work the next morning, which wasn't a particularly great idea. <laughs> anyway, the other thing I was going to talk about today was a couple of weeks ago, I got some uh, brochures through. And I flashed those brochures up on the screen, said, look, there's a brochure. And then on the, the uh, one brochure... Uh, there you go. I went in there and I showed the configuration. All right. And one of the configurations there, in fact, actually, it was on one, two, three, uh, three of the configurations involved the Yamaha Music Computer, which is a CX5M. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've never thought about owning a Yamaha music computer. Clonk, that's the same foot stand going down. I've never really thought about the whole Yamaha music thing, because obviously I, I use, uh, in my day-to-day -day music, I use Ableton and Pro Tools a lot. Um, although I'm starting to go back into Cubase now. I don't know why, but I've started to pick up my old Cubase roots. Anyway, a friend of a friend rang me up knowing that I do this and said would I like the Yamaha music computer? Would I? Yeah. Bite hand off. So last week it arrived 
and here it is. Uh, there you go. Okay. So that is the Yamaha music computer. And on one side, look, it's got joystick ports. So that's the standard Atari style D pin joystick ports. And then at the back, there is a cassette cartridge there. That's the printer port. Then there's some video outputs there and an RGB output. And uh, I think that might be an RF output for TV. Do you remember that? When you used to plug your computers into the TV using the RF single and sit there tuning it very fine until you got a signal. Okay, that's there. And then around on this side, and this is the interesting side, is the MIDI and the sound generation and this thing here, which is where a keyboard plugs in. So that arrived, and I was like, oh, I just got caught up with my microphone lead. And I'll go more on this in a sec. But he also gave me, in its original box, I might add, that wasn't its original box, but this is the original box, is the, the keyboard for said music computer. Now this actually hasn't, to be honest, that was just unboxed uh, just before I started the video. Box is over there. Um, but this hasn't actually been out of the box yet. So here we have the diddly keyboard. Feels like you want to be blowing something, doesn't it? Um, but that is the Yamaha keyboard, which is uh, what one, two, uh, it's about sort of, well, I want to say it's three octaves, but it's three three octaves, not C to C. It's sort of uh, one, two, it's three octaves on the F, isn't it? Three and a half octaves on the F. But that was the YK01 keyboard that went with this. So there's a funny connector there that plugs in the side there. So this arrived, and I was like, well, you know, I suppose I better do some research and find out what the Yamaha music computer was all about. Um, so I saw it on the FBO1 sheet, and then obviously it's arrived. I know, I knew very little about this. Now the first thing you need to know is that the Yamaha music computer has, in the bottom uh, right of the keyboard, an MSX logo. Now, that's quite important because that means that this is actually a Microsoft basic machine. So, back in the day, in I think this was sort of announced in June 1983, um, the Japanese skunk works uh, for Microsoft decided to develop, or they announced that they were developing this uh, basic architecture for running uh, computers. So up until that point, in, in this point in time, 8-bit processors, um, all the computers were had their own basic interpreters and they ran on their own basic. So all, even though basic is, is basic, if that makes any sense, Basic has different flavors for depending on which machine you're running it on, so, and the and the Kings definitely in in the UK at that point in time with the ZX Spectrum on one side and the Commodore 64 on the other, and uh, I pretty much had both of those. In fact, I had the ZX Spectrum. My brother had the Commodore 64, so we had sort of the best of both worlds, really. Um, but this, the whole idea of the MSX stuff was to sort of standardise the architecture of the computer. So you allowed the manufacturer to go off and build um, the computer itself, but around this sort of common architecture. So therefore, you know, God forbid, software, rather than having to be recompiled onto different platforms like it was for the ZX Spectrum and Commodore, you effectively compiled it for the MSX platform and it would then run on all these computers. Um, and it was sort of picked up by a lot of the Japanese um, computer houses of the time, or electronics houses of the time. So Sony, Panasonic, Toshiba, Samsung. Well, I say Japanese, Samsung's not Japanese. But Far East manufacturers of electronics 
all picked up on this and all started building the MSX machines. And there were a whole raft of them. And I remember seeing these in one of the local electronics hardware stores many, many years ago. And, you know, I was sort of kind of tempted with it, but you couldn't get very many games for it. And of course, when you're, when you're 12, 13, which is probably what I would have been around this time, um, you know, it's more important to play games than it is to have a computer that sort of sits there gathering dust. So, you know, that's why most people sort of hooked onto the Spectrum or the, or the Commodore 64 trial, even though there were better computers around, better 8-bit computers around at the time. And if you want to sort of see more about the whole 8-bit revolution, there is a channel on YouTube called The 8-Bit Guy, and he goes over all kinds of this sort of stuff, so, yeah, go check him out. Um, anyway... The, the, the whole, this was sort of kind of forerunner, if you like, for, for MS-DOS. And in fact, you can actually run MS-DOS on one of these machines, on one of the later machines. Um, uh, one of the basic DOS sets. So, you know, it is possible to actually run a DOS operating system, an MS-DOS operating system on this, rather than the MS basic system that is currently installed on this in the ROM chip. Anyway, that's enough of the computer lesson, because that's not what we're here for. Anyway, there were three models of this thing. There was um, the CSM, C uh, CX5M, which was the basic. Then there was the CX5M, which was the next model up. And then there was a thir the third generation, which is actually what this is, which was the CS CX5M2128. Now, don't get confused, because I thought, well, 128 probably meant it had 128k of RAM. Now, I've yet to plug this in, but I think it's only 64k of RAM. I think the 2 and the 3 only had 64k of RAM, but I stand to be corrected um, when I actually plug it in and start playing with it. It hasn't actually got that far yet. Um, all it's done is got out, they've got out of the box and been uh, dusted. Very, very lightly dusted, I might add. So, um, the first version of this thing contained an FM sound module. So I'm just going to pause the video at this point. There was a reason why I paused the video, because I need to go and get a screwdriver. So, I have taken out a screw. And the reason I've taken it out is so that you can see what the sound module looks like. So the first one came with the sound module, which was a SFG01. Reading off my notes are on the floor. And the sound module effectively plugs into the side of this thing. So that's the underside. This is the sound module, and it comes out like so. And there is the sound module. Now that is, in essence, a four operator FM synthesizer. And I'll come back onto that in a minute. And that literally just plugs into this cartridge slot on the bottom of this machine. Now this is, this I believe is the, the upgraded version, although I'm not 100% sure um, whether it is or it isn't, if I'm honest. Because it doesn't have any writing on it that will actually indicate one way or the other. But, um, and that just effectively slots into there. Right, so, and it's secured with the screw. I'm not going to re-secure it with the screw just yet. The two, pick my notes back up, came with a upgraded sound module. So the two came with uh, an SF05 FM sound module. Now the difference between the one and the two was predominantly uh, over how the module itself coped with MIDI signals. So in the one, it it was it wasn't set up to cope for external MIDI. So it was quite happy to push MIDI out, but it wasn't really particularly good at receiving MIDI from external sources. Um, in fact, it didn't do it at all. But that's what the one where the one failure was was around that. When the two came along, the two allows you to actually. A, play MIDI in through the sound module itself, so it accepts external MIDI. But B, allows you to play from an external MIDI keyboard the sounds 
on the FM module that's in the computer. Okay, and then comes the three. Now the three still has the upgraded um, SF05 FM sound modules, the same module as the two. But the difference between the two and the three predominantly was about was related to the computer, not the sound module. So one to two, same computer, different sound module. Two to three, different upgraded computer, same sound module. Right? And the three has an, a proper RGB output, whereas the two and the one, as I understand it, have some weird five pin DIN arrangement that's not recognized by anybody. But the, the three is a standard arrangement for RGB, and I'll, I'll verify that very shortly when I plug it into my monitor behind me and find out what happens. Hopefully I'm not going to blow things up. Um, the other thing about the two, uh, sorry, the three over the one and the two, is the three has these two card slots. Now, the way software was loaded onto this was one of two mechanisms. One mechanism was the, was the fabled tape. So you put a tape into a cassette machine and you would then be able to load the software onto the machine as it went zzz, bu, 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 as it used to do in back in those days. Um, so that was, that was one mechanism. I say two, it's actually three. The second mechanism was they, they produced a hard drive, sorry, not a hard drive, a floppy drive module that used standard three and a half inch disks. So again, um, looking back at that period of time, you know, right up until or quite late, um, you know, other manufacturers were using weird format, two and a half, 2.8 inch disks, three inch uh, quick drives. But Yamaha had adopted the standard three and a half inch double sided double density discs. Admittedly, this thing can only read a 720 kilobyte disc, but still they had adopted the three and a half inch standard. Um, and they've adopted that on their sampler for this, for this sort of period of time, which was a TX16W, um, which I have in the studio. And that's all three and a half inch um, floppy drives as well. So all, all, you know, Yamaha, in terms of their technology ad adoption, were quite ahead of the time when it came to this sort of thing, because um, this was, you know, this was launched in 1983, uh, 83 or was it 84? Uh, I think this was launched a year after the standard, so this would have been 1984, I think. I'm not sure which year this this was actually from because I can't tell. It's quite a late production. Um, so yeah, so Yamaha was quite ahead of the time in terms of adopting or producing a floppy drive. And that actually interfaced with this by operator or occupying one of these slots. So you plugged it into that slot and you could load software or music or whatever it happens to be from the floppy drive. And then the third mechanism they gave you was they gave you some cartridges. Now I don't have any cartridges that I can show you. Um, I might sort of flash one up on the screen to see, see what it looks like. But effectively what they did was they had cartridges and those cartridges slot into here. Now a lot of the Yamaha editing software for this thing comes on cartridge. Okay, so um, if I go back to the FBO1 book clip here and I look at the, the configuration, um, they say the voice editing software um, is a YRM506. So for the FBO1, the software that will allow you to directly edit the FBO1 from this computer is on a cartridge which is white which is 506 so it's good to know which is really interesting because funny enough in the actual manual for the computer itself it doesn't mention the 506 but it doesn't mention the dx7 editing software so oh that's okay oh, yeah. um so I just looked at the video, the video counter and it was reading six minutes and I'm sitting there thinking I've done more than six minutes but I stopped the video, didn't I? Um, so the synthesizer itself, as I said, is a four operator FM synth, which is eight note polyphonic. Okay, so that basically means you can play eight notes before the first note is released. Now, 
If you look at the, the specification for this, the specification is very, very similar to a DX7, the flagship DX7 um, commercial synth, or then you move up to sort of the CX5 and the CX, um, the DX1 and the DX5, sorry, CX, um, in terms of very, very similar, very, very similar. And there's actually a good reason for that, and I, I didn't realize this, but effectively, the, the, the FM synthesizer that is in this thing, that tone module I just pulled out, well, guess what? It's an FBO1. It's exactly the same as an FBO1. Um, the, between the, uh, the, the modules, the SFG01 and the FFG05, effectively Yamaha upgraded the sound chip. So the sound chip in the, in the 01, was a YM2151, um, which was upgraded to the YM2164 chip. And that YM6, 612, um, the YM2164 chip is the one that's appeared in all the sound cards and all the you know, uh, peripherals that sort of that spawned out of this era. So, you know, quite a lot of the ad lib cards, the creative card, the sound blaster stuff, that was all based on this chipset. Yeah. Um, the FM synthesizer itself just has 48 slots in it, although having said that, slot number 48 seems to be empty. Um, it will, there's nothing written against it in the, the user manual. As I say, I haven't fired it up yet, so I can't, I can't tell that. Um, but if you look down the list of string of, of, of voices, there are, you know, sort of typically four or five br brass and um, four or five string sounds which was sort of typical of a synthesizer of this era. But you've also got on this, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm led to believe, and again, having not fired this thing up, that it has the e-piano sound. The legendary DX7 e-piano sound is on this thing as well. Um, and there's a, there's a number of, again, you know, sort of about five, four or five e-organ sounds on there. Um, cartridges for this thing, now again, uh, I'm, I'm just doing a sort of some research on this. Uh, there's some notable cartridges here. The one is a uh, is a MIDI recorder cartridge, so that effectively turns this into a MIDI recording studio. Um, unfortunately, it's only four track real time recording, but you know I suppose back in the day, four tracks was better than no tracks. Um, and you looked at where things evolved. So you know at this point in time, the the Commodore Amiga and the Atari ST hadn't arrived on the scene. They would they wouldn't arrive for a number a couple of years after this. So this was sort of the this was bleeding edge at the time. Um, there is a an RX editor for RX drum machines. I don't own an RX drum machine, so I won't be buying that one. Um, and then there's the DX7 voicing program, which is an editor for the DX uh, and the TX instrument range. And there's several voicing programs actually depending on the on which DX architecture you have. So there's um, there's a seven, there's a nine, and there's a there's a hundred. What's it? I shall refer to the DX twenty one. Oh. Um, the reason I think it's a hundred because they've written it down here as DX twenty one twenty one in brackets twenty seven one hundred. Um, so, yes, uh, a very interesting uh, package to turn up on my doorstep. So, thank you very much, you know who you are, um, for supplying that. I am sure it's going to get some very rude words shouted at it for in the next couple of days as I start to play with it, to find out what it does. Um, but, yes, very, very interesting. And on that note, I'm going to leave you for another week. So it's that point where I say, did you enjoy it? Because if you did, please give this video a thumbs up. I'm sure by now, if you didn't enjoy it, you've given this video a thumbs down. That's just life. Not everybody enjoys everything, and I recognize that. Over here somewhere is a subscribe button. If you press the subscribe button, every time I upload content to the channel, you will get a notification. I know I upload videos like this, which is sort of the rant, I upload videos about mailbag items, which is where you or your friends or 
other YouTubers have left comments on the channel about specific pieces of equipment and I try to answer those. And I also do videos about the equipment that is within my studio, um, how to use it, how to take it apart and sometimes how to repair it. That's what you get from subscribing. It'd be wonderful to see you as a subscriber at some point. Over here will be two videos. One will always be the latest video that I've uh, published to the channel. Another video will be selected at random from the channel based on your preferences by a YouTube algorithm, but it will always be a video from my channel. What's all that's left for me to do is say, I hope to see you again soon and bye-bye.